you know, I've had the fortune or misfortune of, of surviving about three wars, 99 combat missions, 436 carrier landings day, night, and so forth, and 17 service air missile engagements and one aircraft ejection. I feel like I'm a pretty privileged guy. Um, but through that experience, there was some opportunity of meeting some truly incredible people, and, and the one pearl that I wanna share with you in these few short minutes here is, is somebody in my mind that represents the greatest strategic genius of our time and has a tenant that's so widespread and, and the ability to utilize it covers such a broad swath that it served me well, as well as countless others. Now, you know, who, who could this person be? Would it be uh, General Patton? You know, the architect in the, uh, behind the Third Army and the successes that led to conquering the Germans in World War II? Could it be General Schwarzkopf? The, you know, also the mastermind between for, for Desert Storm, or could it possibly be John Wayne? Because he's John Wayne. <laughs> but really the person I'm talking about right now that, that has affected more people than I can count is this lady. And her name's Mrs. Dorset, and she was my third grade teacher. And I have to tell you about Mrs. Dorset. She's one of these ladies in a school in McKinley Elementary School in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And and this woman loved everybody. Now, to look at her, you'd see jet black hair. You'd see this, I call it a Halloween white complexion. And the brightest red lipstick you ever saw. And every kid left her classroom with red lipstick on their face. I mean, she even loved a smelly kid. More on that in a little bit, because I probably was the smelly kid. But she did. And, and uh, she inspired everybody, everybody around her in her class in third grade. So what is this strategic genius? What does she have to say that is worth spreading? This. You have to use what you have at hand. It's brilliant. It's simple. And how she came across to explain this to everybody is that, I mean, imagine it. In elementary school, the, the single greatest thing you wanted to do in the year was to go to the pet and hobby show. You could, you could sh demonstrate your hobbies and let the, let the principal judge them. And the best part is you could bring your pet. And this particular student of hers had a banny rooster named Woodstock. And he was proud of that, that, that chicken. And he wanted to show it off, but he ripped his pants before the judging could happen. And he was going to have to leave to maintain modesty. But Mrs. Dorsett said, Let's use what we have at hand. So she took a stapler and oh so gently made him regain his modesty and he was able to go to the pet and hobby show. Very simple story, but it's one that she reinforced all the time about everything. And, and I've used that over and over again. And, and, it's, and, and it's worked quite well for me. Now when you're six months old, and this is a picture of me, and my mom would say that that's a smile of satisfaction because I just loaded my diaper up to monstrous proportions. And <laughs> so I'll try not to show you that look while I'm up here on stage, but no guarantees. But when you're six months old, you rarely know what things will happen, but you're guided by, by a number of influences on your life, and, and Mrs. Dorsett certainly did mine. Because when I got out of high school, I went to say, well, she said I have to use what I have at hand, but the bigger question was, what do I have at hand? And so I inventoried that. I said, well, I've got a work ethic, thanks to my dad. Um, I've got a high school degree. And, uh, you know, what else do I have? Well, then I came information. And my father said, hey, our horseshoer is quitting to go into the feed business. So that'd be an opportunity. So information was what I didn't have at hand at that point. But then I go, OK. So I went and became a horseshoer. So what were the consequences of that? Well. It allowed me to go to college to help pay for that. That and a partial scholarship for sports. And then ultimately come to the cultural center of the universe, Oklahoma State, go Pokes. <laughs> and, and it led to even more things that I had at hand, which was education, information, relationships, all of which is a potpourri 
that lets you execute using what you have at hand to do unbelievable things or things beyond what, you, what an individual would think they could do. So after graduating, eventually, uh, with a degree in geology from Oklahoma State, I did another inventory. What do I have at hand? Pretty much the same thing I had, but I had a degree. It was in geology in 1984, and the decline of the energy industry at that point was becoming traumatic. So the, an undergrad degree in geology didn't get you much. So I inventoried some more. I had a friend of mine that had a brother that was a geologist down working in New Orleans. Coincidentally, the World's Fair was down there. So we mixed business with opportunity, and away I go down and start peddling my resume in New Orleans, and I caught a fish. Luckily, went to work for Schlumberger for two glorious years of getting experience, education, sweating the summers in the Gulf of Mexico and freezing in 80 below up in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. The only well drilled to date up there for two winters. And so that whole inventory again of what I had at hand or that was available because in 1986, what happened there? You know, oil went down to about $6 a barrel or something like that. So looking down the road, it looked like that path was going to stop. So I read a newspaper, San Francisco newspaper, had an ad in it, said, get an office with a view, Navy officer programs. And it had a pilot looking out of a jet down on the flight deck. And I said, maybe that's for me. And I'm going, well, let's see, what do I have? College degree, work experience. Uh, some degree of success in that and so forth. So I applied. And by some act of God, got accepted into that, yelled at a Marine Corps drill, yelled, <laughs> was yelled at by a Marine Corps drill instructor for three months, and they said, okay, go to flight school. It was absolutely amazing. But using what I had at hand got me to that point. And then look at this video, because the challenges, look at the horizon on this video. Because... The challenges that I found that I thought I could deal with, it, they got blown out of the water when I was look, figured out that if you're landing on an aircraft carrier, it moves. <laughs> it moves every direction, forward, up, down, left, right. And the things that gave me comfort, especially at night. You know what happens at night when you land on an aircraft carrier? Two things. One, you find religion because you will pray to anybody that'll listen that you can get <laughs> aboard it a lot. And the other one is it makes you the biggest sinner in the world because at the moment you're making promises, you know you can't keep them. <laughs> so, so you find religion and you give God a lot to work with. So, you know, but what gave me comfort in that was being scared to death and inventorying what I had at hand. $20 million worth of training on just me. Same amount for my crew member in the back. Landing signal officer, a specialist on expeditious and safe recovery of aircraft. And 5,000 men and women brave souls whose sole purpose is to launch and recover airplanes and accomplish a mission in between time. But the original part of this was flying out. That was just getting home. That didn't deal with any of the other things. Now you go to 1999, and there was genocide going on in the Kosovo province in the former Yugoslavia. Tragic thing to see from the air, actually, but we were asked to do something. NATO allies were asked to do an interesting thing. Without deployment of ground forces, it was to attack and stop the genocide with air power only. So what happened? Inventoried what we had at hand. We had lessons learned from Vietnam. Some United States Marine Corps lessons learned that could be applied to that thing. And we had the brilliance of an Okie and an Okie State grad named Sodbuster Benson, who's a character in his own right. He looks like a mustache walking at you. But he, uh, and he's a city manager of Enid. And six years before the need arise, he said, we need to integrate and do a few things. And, it, and that led to us being able to put together the me mechanism in which to stop that genocide. Now, the next thing that happened after that, coming back from Kosovo, is ended up at Johns Hopkins University in this vault for secret stuff. And it was operators and people from the industrial complex to look at what are some mechanized solutions to what was going on over there. And really the challenges was informational and interpersonal. It wasn't on weapons. And so it came down, they said, we need a weapon that can hit moving targets. And 
What did I say? Let's use what we have at hand. It's a Vietnam-era weapon called a laser maverick. We've already got it. Let's not spend resources on what we think we need. Let's use what we have at hand. And so an Okie boy at Johns Hopkins University, a place I never thought I'd end up being, was quoting Mrs. Dorset, my third grade teacher. It was amazing. So then in 2006, I get a phone call from a deep water drilling guy that read a white paper from University of Aberdeen, Scotland. And, he's, and it basically said two things. The drilling industry would be well served if it used the best practices of aircraft carrier aviation and commercial aviation in space. The second part was if you had fighter pilots and astronauts teaching it, it'd be even bit more well served. And that started off on developing a syllabus of what we had at hand. Knowledge of the Top Gun syllabus, knowledge of air wing training syllabus, we pulled jets and aircraft carriers out, dropped in drilling rigs, and it worked magnificently to a great extent. And many folks are finding these types of things out when they realize what they have at hand and have the gumption and the wherewithal to expand what they have at hand. And Chesapeake and Nomad Drilling is a good example of this. Just a few short months ago, they took a, a uh, integrated these resources together, including Check 6, and put processes in place that cut rig move times by 60% or so. What does that mean? You can have the same number of rigs and access more energy. Or you can use less rigs to accomplish the same objective. It's using what you have at hand. I mean, my daughter, for example, is teenage daughter, when her piggy bank starts running low but has the the pressures of, of uh, you know, the fashion environment out there. And I go, honey, you got enough money? And she says, don't worry, Dad, I never pay retail. <laughs> I use what I have at hand. And wouldn't it be wonderful if other parts of our great nation listened to Mrs. Dorset? Congress, for example. <laughs> you know, because the real thing with this is Using what you have at hand, it defines conservation. I mean, it defines human grace. You know, it's the means to doing more with less. And what is TED? It's a corroboration event. We're finding out what we have at hand so we can use all this information to greater effect. You know, it's absolutely, in my mind, brilliant. And, you know, brilliance doesn't come in in dramatic schemes and so forth, sometimes comes from your third grade teacher. Do this one thing for me. Let's all say this, like you mean it. Use what you have at hand. Come on, like we're coming from Oklahoma State. Use what you have at hand. Feels good to say it, doesn't it? Listen, thank you all. I hope this is something you can use. It served me well. Thank you for your tax dollars that turned a horseshoe into a fighter pilot. Only in America. And thank you all.